Welcome to our first lecture of the week as we will discuss America in the Great Depression and we're going to specifically look today at Herbert Hoover's response to the onset of the Great Depression in uh, the early 1930s as well as the presidential election of 1932. So, uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, uh, the Great Depression occurred um, with the stock market crash in late October of 1929, Black Tuesday, uh, and we discussed in that uh, lecture the causes of the Great Depression, the economic uh, slide that, that was gradual in nature. Uh, that had been occurring in America since 1927, but it had been occurring, occurring on a small scale, sort of in, in a piecemeal fashion, meaning bit by bit, as opposed to all at once. So it went unnoticed by many Americans, both uh, federal government leaders, such as Her Herbert Hoover, as well as um, Andrew Mellon, his Treasury Secretary, but also fairly unnoticed by uh, most of the American population. That all changed, of course, with Black Tuesday in 1929 um, as the stock market crashed and it marked the end of a, a month-long period in which the, uh, the average value of an individual stock dropped 37% from the beginning of October to the end of October of 1929. So the question then becomes, how do you respond to that? What do you do uh, when that occurs if you are the president of the United States or uh, a cabinet advisor or somebody else close to the president who um, can advise him on financial policy matters? And both Hoover and Mellon failed to grasp the severity of the Great Depression. Um, they had lived through previous economic downturns and they knew through history that America had had a series of economic downturns periodically. Uh, earlier this semester, we talked about the Panic of 1873. There was a similar panic in 1893 uh, and another uh, brief recession in the uh, first decade of the 1900s. And in each case, the economy eventually bounced back and, um, and returned to some level of normalcy. And Hoover and Mellon believed that that would happen in the wake of Black Tuesday, that times would be tough for a while economically, maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe even a year and a half, but they believed that uh, the economy would bounce back and the, the crash was just another example of a market correction in the cyclical nature of the American economy at that time. Um, because they had this, uh, these, uh, this outlook on the depression, Neither Hoover nor Mellon nor any of Hoover's other advisors really knew how to effectively to re respond to the crisis that accompanied the onset of the Great Depression. Um, Mellon in particular, who like Hoover had been in uh, a key financial policy position for the entire decade of the 20s. I mentioned Hoover had served as the Commerce Secretary for uh, both Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge before he ran for president. Andrew Mellon had served as the Treasury Secretary for both Harding and Coolidge prior to Hoover's election, and he remained in that post when Hoover took office. And Mellon believed that uh, the Great Depression did not require any additional government intervention or legislation or any sort of policy initiatives um, that were 
designed to specifically combat uh, the economic crisis that was the Great Depression. Hoover thought that uh, at the very least he needed to reassure uh, comp the, pub the American public and inspire confidence in American business and the American economy. And so uh, Hoover asked business owners and leaders to do whatever they had to do to keep their facilities open, keep factories open, keep stores open and operational. And he also pleaded with union leaders at the time to refrain from striking. Um, in addition, Hoover uh, wanted to coordinate uh, the charitable relief that were that was uh, available to Americans via private charitable organizations. So he created an agency to sort of coordinate the relief between the government and uh, private organizations. This organization was known as the President's Organization for Unemployment Relief, or POOR, if you will. Um, but unfortunately for um, Hoover and his advisors and the American public as a whole, the demand for aid from Americans far outstripped the ability for uh, these private uh, charitable relief organizations to deliver aid to them. Even with some assistance from the federal government, uh, there was just too many people who had lost either their jobs or their savings or their homes and needed a tremendous amount of relief. As a result, many of these private charitable organizations closed by the middle of the 1930s. They just couldn't handle the demand that came with uh, the Great Depression. It was just a, a, a stark, you know, real uh, downturn that nobody really knew how to combat and nobody knew how long it would last. And so I, I want to take a look now at the, the impact of the depression um, in America. It, it was unprecedented on many uh, fronts, but just the sheer volume of Americans who lost their jobs is very hard to fathom even today. Uh, the nation's unemployment rate went from 1.6 million people in 1929, uh, and remember the, the stock market crashed at the end of October 1929, so late in the calendar year of 1929, um, to a rate of 12.8 million unemployed by 1933. That essentially meant that the unemployment rate went from approximately 3% of America's total labor force uh, prior to Black Tuesday to approximately 25% of America's labor force by um, 1933. The, one of the few comparable examples that we've had since the Great Depression occurred uh, a year ago at this time. If you remember back to March and April and May um, of 2020, uh, when the coronavirus uh, you know, first arrived and really began to wreak havoc in America. I'm sure you'll remember all the businesses that closed um, and people uh, being laid off from their jobs or furloughed from their jobs. The stock, the stock market tanked initially, uh, but gradually uh, the economy began to recover First, the stock market recovered, although that's not really a true um, measure of the economy writ large, the strength of the economy writ large, but the stock market began to improve by mid to late April, early May, um, and businesses found ways to uh, continue to operate even in amidst the pandemic um, via takeout, uh, food uh, for restaurants as well as um, other strategies to limit 
face-to-face -face in interpersonal um, contact. Um, and and as, if you'll recall, the, the federal government also passed a relief act to deal with the coronavirus, extending loans to businesses during that time, providing stimulus checks to Americans during that time. That was the response, you know, almost right away with uh, the coronavirus. I mean, in very short order after the, the um, economic downturn began with the coronavirus, the federal government uh, found ways to act uh, to, to combat the, the economic slide, and that was through Congress and, um, and the president, uh, Donald Trump at the time. Uh, if you got one of the checks back in the spring or summer, I mean, I'm sure you remember it was signed by, by Trump. His signature was quite prominent on the check. Um, but Congress uh, passed the, the, the CARES Act and, and established this um, relief system and um, the executive branch um, approved it and, and went forward with it. And we see that that's still ongoing as uh, the current president, Joe Biden, has um, passed another uh, stimulus uh, package on uh, for rank and file Americans, but it's also a, another large coronavirus relief act um, was uh, recently passed through Congress. None of this happened during the Great Depression, at least not initially, not in the first six months or the first year, um, because Hoover and Mellon and other federal leaders did not really understand the nature and the scope of the economic crisis that America found itself in and assumed that the country would be able to find a way to come out of it, uh, financially speaking. And um, they, they grossly underestimated it. And as a result, Americans had to do whatever they could to survive. That meant selling their family farms or residential homes. That meant withdrawing whatever money they had in banks before banks closed. Numerous banks failed during um, this time period. Um, approximately 9,000 banks nationwide failed uh, and, and shuttered their doors uh, during the first uh, four or five years of the Great Depression. And um, as a result, once uh, Americans got whatever they could uh, out of their bank accounts or out of their physical assets like home and property, they created makeshift shelter areas, uh, makeshift shelter communities, uh, I should say, um, in urban areas, oftentimes alongside railroad tracks and city dumps. These areas were known as Hoovervilles um, after the president because the president um, suffered a, a tremendous decline in popularity uh, and in public opinion as most of the blame for the crisis fell on Herbert Hoover and the Republican Party as a whole. So these Hoovervilles, um, as you can see in the slide in the upper right-hand corner, or, or in the image, I should say, in the in this slide in the upper right hand corner, this is a picture of a Hooverville um, in the Seattle, Washington area, circa 1930, 1931. Um, you can see the train in the in the background there, so it's right up against alongside uh, railroad tracks, and these are makeshift shacks, tar paper shacks. Um, perhaps some abandoned rail cars in there that were serving as shelter for people that lived in Hoovervilles. And there were communities like this in urban areas across America. This is one in Seattle, places like New York and Boston and Chicago. I mean, you name the major city in America at this time, and there were probably multiple Hoovervilles that you could 
locate within that uh, city's urban area. Um, individuals that lived in Hoovervilles in Hoovervilles um, referred to an inside-out pants pocket as a Hoover flag. That that was sort of the the symbol of uh, Hooverville and the the destitute nature of um, the indiv individuals that lived in Hooverville as they had to make do with this substandard shelter, substandard home, and they had no money in their pockets, inside out pockets. Um, as I mentioned, Herbert Hoover took the fall um, and much of the blame for this in 1930 during the midterm elections. The Democratic Party gained control of the House of Representatives. The Republicans maintained control of the U.S. Senate, but the Democrats won enough seats that they were able to form an alliance with sort of the moderate Western, uh, the moderate leaning Republican senators from Western states. So uh, even though they didn't technically have a majority in the Senate at this time, uh, the Democrats uh, and the block of moderate Western Republican senators aligned together um, to um, pass legislation during this time that uh, the rest of the Republican Party was not in favor of. So eventually, public speeches and urging confidence um, in the economy and pleading with business owners to keep their companies and their businesses open during the Great Depression, all of which were measures that Herbert Hoover took during the first year, year and a half of the Depression. Eventually, that wasn't enough. Eventually, there needed to be uh, more government intervention uh, to specifically combat the financial crisis that was the Great Depression. Uh, you know, I, I, we've mentioned the pro-business policies that had started with Warren Harding's presidency, continued with Calvin Coolidge's presidency, and continued with Herbert Hoover's presidency. Much of them were still in place, and this was sort of a an era of hands-off of American business by the federal government. Um, it was laissez-faire, it was an era of deregulation, and it was an era of very limited federal oversight. And the new Congress that came in following the 1930 midterms in early 1931 decided that there needed to be some specific uh, legislation and specific policy initiatives that the government had to um, create or establish in order to overcome the Great Depression, whether Hoover wanted to do it or not. Uh, so the first thing Congress did on that front was create the Re Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was an agency that delivered loans to uh, beleaguered businesses uh, in a variety of industries, including banks, life insurance companies, building and loan societies, farm mortgage associations, and railroads. Uh, these were emergency loans that were given to businesses in those specific sectors of the economy to try to keep them open and operational, to try to give them enough funds and capital to survive uh, the Great Depression. That was what the, the purpose of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was. In addition to the RFC, um, a piece of legislation passed Congress known as the Glass-Steagall Act and Hoover signed it into law. This legislation uh, provided a greater availability of commercial loans, and it also released 
uh, approximately $750 million from the Federal Reserve to increase the supply of credit at the time. So this was basically, um, again, uh, relief provided to businesses, particularly to banks and, and other um, companies that dealt in um, loans and mortgages and things of that nature to try to keep them afloat. Uh, there was another act called the Federal Home Loan Bank Act of 1932, which established banks that would provide discount home mortgages to try to um, enable Americans to continue to pay their mortgage and stay in their homes, um, or to be able, if they had money and to, to buy a, a home at a, and get a, at a, a a reasonable discounted mortgage rate to be able to, to move into a new home. Obviously, there weren't many people doing that at the time, but for the few that that were on solid enough economic footing to do so, the, the Federal Home Loan Bank um, Act provided uh, the means to do so. Uh, unfortunately for Hoover, uh, not all of these legislative acts were popular with the American people because they were seen as uh, attempts to keep businesses alive, but not necessarily provide financial relief to rank and file American citizens. So if we go back for a moment and take a look back at the, the spring and summer of 2020 and the coronavirus, um, relief that uh, was passed by Congress, you know, we'll, you can see that th that was twofold. Um, first, they, uh, the legislation provided uh, loans specifically to business um, payment protection plan loans to keep businesses open um, so that uh, you know, if the businesses couldn't operate uh, for safety reasons, that they would have enough money to pay their employees and pay their um, their rents and leases and things like that, so that when public health restrictions were loosened, they could uh, reopen their businesses. Um, and then the second. Uh, part of the COVID Relief Act of last spring and summer was to provide money specifically to American citizens. You probably are aware of the stimulus checks that went out to American citizens and American families. So uh, the COVID Relief Act of last spring and summer, uh, how, there was one portion of it that was designed specifically to provide relief to businesses and another portion that was specifically to provide relief to um, regular American citizens. And in the uh, m most recent COVID Relief Act that was uh, just passed by Congress um, and signed by President Biden, it's the same thing. Um, Americans are getting stimulus checks and certain businesses and industries are also getting additional financial relief to try to get America through uh, the COVID crisis on a financial standpoint. Well, if we go back to the Great Depression and look at what the Congress did in 1931 and 32 and what Hoover was willing to sign um, into law, it was aid that was primarily directed at keeping businesses alive and industries alive, but that personal relief aid, those the personal checks that went to individual citizens, individual families that um, were part of the COVID relief legislation, that was absent in uh, the federal response to the Great Depression. In 1931, and a lot of critics pointed that out at the time. <coughs> so Hoover, even when he tried 
uh, with Congress to work with Congress to provide some sort of government relief during the era of the Great Depression, the early years of the Great Depression. Uh, many Americans felt that it didn't go far enough because it didn't uh, enable individuals to get direct relief in the form of checks that they could use to cover day-to-day -day expenses at that time. And that's <clears throat> something that uh, we've seen in the last year uh, uh, has been different with the relief package for, for coronavirus that it's been um, directed at providing loans and, and economic relief to businesses, but also financial assistance to individual American citizens, individual American families to help them uh, get through uh, the economic crisis uh, that uh, stemmed from um, the COVID pandemic. So that was yet another reason why Hoover's uh, approval ratings declined, uh, much like the Hoovervilles that we previously discussed, the fact that regular American citizens couldn't get direct relief <clears throat> from legislation during this time period. Another uh, key event that um, caused Hoover's um, public image to decline even further occurred in the spring and summer of 1932. Um, 1932 was a presidential election year, and due to the um, financial crisis, there was a public protest staged in Washington, D.C. in the spring and early summer of 1932 by American military veterans. Um, in 1924, eight years earlier, Congress had passed a bill that would provide cash bonuses as a form of life insurance for World War I veterans, American military veterans of World War I and their families, but that those cash bonuses would not become available for World War I veterans or their family members until 1945, um, 21 years after Congress passed the bill. And, um, 27 years after uh, America's involvement in World War I ended. Again, these bonuses were sort of a, a life insurance, a, a cash pension, if you will, to military families. Well, when the Great Depression hit and banks began to close in record numbers, understandably, uh, the military veterans of World War I were concerned that there wouldn't be enough money for their cash bonuses if they waited until 1945, as the legislation initially called for, to collect. So in 1932, they demanded the cash bonus immediately. We need, we need this uh, cash bonus that you promised us from uh, legislation that you passed eight years earlier under a different presidential administration. We need it now because we don't have uh, faith that it will be available 13 years later in 1945. And also our biggest financial need, our biggest financial crisis is right now here in 1932. That was the general sentiment, the general argument uh, that members of the Bonus Art Army presented. They came to D.C. and marched uh, in Washington, D.C. They also occupied um, vacant government buildings and a, a shanty town adjacent to the Capitol. Basically, it became something of an encampment for these uh, military veterans as they tried to implore Congress and President Hoover to pass legislation and sign it that would give that their previously agreed upon cash bonuses to them immediately rather than down the road. <clears throat> 
1945. And it worked with the House of Representatives as the House passed legislation that authorized an, an immediate payout to the veterans. Unfortunately for those military veterans, the Senate did not pass it. It failed to clear the Senate and uh, a significant portion of the bonus army left Washington, D.C. empty-handed. Yet a few hundred folks remain um, and stayed in the in the shantytown area and um, alongside the capital into the summer months. And um, when they refused to leave by late July, local authorities decided that they needed to tear down the shantytown um, and force these bonus army veterans to vacate Washington, D.C., or at least vacate the capital area. Um, so that led to a scrum between uh, the Bonus Army veterans and the Washington, D.C. police force. You can see in the photo in the upper left-hand corner of the slide um, what that um, scrum looked like. Um, and in the midst of this, a policeman shot and killed two of the military veterans. Following this skirmish, 700 federal troops were deployed to the shanty town to forcibly remove the bonus army holdouts uh, from the area and they burned the remaining shelters uh, that were on the premises to uh, ensure that these uh, folks would not return. So the end result of this is it's another black eye on the public image of Herbert Hoover and it's happening in the course of a presidential election year. Uh, the American public did not have confidence in Hoover, did not feel that he had the answers to solve uh, the economic crisis that was the Great Depression. Um, so, as you might expect, Hoover wound up losing um, the uh, presidential election in 1932, falling short of his bid of, for re-election. Um, the Democratic Party nominated Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who at the time was the governor of New York. Uh, he had previously been a vice presidential nominee on a losing uh, ticket in 1920. Um, but Roosevelt, as he campaigned, brought a message of optimism, um, but he also effectively sold the American public on a, his plan to use creative and bold initiatives to combat the financial crisis that had resulted uh, from the stock market crash. He also vowed to repeal prohibition, uh, much like his predecessor at the top of the Democratic ticket, Al Smith in 1928, who had vowed to end prohibition and uh, Smith wound up losing that election and Hoover kept prohibition in place. Roosevelt vowed to repeal prohibition as well. And uh, as I mentioned, Hoover just could not uh, inspire or project any sort of confidence among the American public and voters believe that he was unfit to lead the country through this crisis any longer than he already had. FDR won both the popular vote and the Electoral College by a comfortable margin. And that wraps up uh, our lecture for today. Um, we will um, take a look at Roosevelt's policy plans to fight the uh, Great Depression, um, which are collectively known as the New Deal. And we'll also take a look at American life in the Great Depression in greater detail in our next lectures later this week. The next lecture will be on Friday.